Welcome to the live stream of Pine Haven Presbyterian Church. This is the last week that we will be quarantining from corporate worship, and we will resume meeting in September. Remember, the first Sunday lunch in September has been canceled. We ask all of you to be considerate moving forward with the increased cases in our area. If you are experiencing any symptoms or have been exposed outside of the church, please stay home and worship with us through the live stream as you follow appropriate protocol before returning. If you test positive, please notify the session via Carly so we can best evaluate the situation. Uh, by way of announcements, Larkin and Leon uh, seem to be doing better. Um, they had, of course, COVID, and uh, Larkin is still in the hospital, but Leon has been um, treated at home. Anita came down with COVID earlier this week. However, she is doing better now. Anita, excuse me, remember Vicki Minor with her recent diagnosis of breast cancer? and she is waiting to undergo radiation treatment and possibly um, chemotherapy. So remember those things in your prayers. Uh, let's, take a, uh, let's take a moment of silent reflection to prepare ourselves for, more, for worshiping uh, God. Amen. Let's hear the call to worship coming from uh, Psalm 57, verse 9 through 11. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among all peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Amen. Let's again go to God in prayer. We come to you, Father, Son, and Spirit, to give thanks to you, O Lord, to magnify your name, to declare your praises from the heavens and your faithfulness from the clouds. We thank you, Father, for loving us and sending your Son willingly to take on flesh and to die for our sins. We thank you, Christ, for uh, being willing to live and die for us. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for applying to us all the benefits of Christ. Truly, your triune name is worthy of worship, for indeed, you, your steadfast love is better than life. Amen. If you would please turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah 51, verses 58 through 64. Jeremiah 51, verses 58 through 64. In Jeremiah 51, 58 through 64, we will see Babylon's destruction predicted for the last time. For emphasis, Jeremiah says to Sarai, who is obligated to read the prophecy to the Babylonians. When he reads it to all the people, he is to tie a stone to it for emphasis and throw it in the Euphrates River and say, Thus Babylon sink to rise no more. 
So let's take up and read Jeremiah 51, verses 58 through 64. Thus says the Lord of hosts, The broad wall of Babylon shall be leveled to the ground, and her high gates shall be burned with fire. The peoples labor for nothing, and the nations weary themselves only for fire. The word, of, the word that Jeremiah the prophet commanded Sariah, the son of Neriah, son of Machshiah, when he went with Zedekiah, the king of Judah, to Babylon in the fourth year of his reign. Sariah was the quartermaster. Jeremiah wrote in a book all the disaster that should come upon Babylon. All these words that are written concerning Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Sariah, when you, come to the, when you come to Babylon, see that you read all these words and say, O Lord, you have said concerning this place that you will cut it off so that nothing shall dwell in it, neither man nor beast, and it shall be desolate forever. When you finish reading this book, tie a stone to it and cast it into the midst of the Euphrates, and say, Thus Babylon, sink to rise no more, because of the disaster that I am bringing upon her, and they shall become exhausted. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. Amen. We come to a portion uh, where we confess our faith together. Please take out your copy of the Heidelberg Catechism. I will recite the question if you will recite the answer with me. It is by faith alone that we share in Christ and all his benefits. Where then does this where then does that faith come from? The Holy Spirit works it in our hearts by the preaching of the Holy Gospel and confirms it by the use of the Holy Sacraments. Amen. I'll pray uh, for the people now. <clears throat> Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have loved us and commanded us to pray, not for your benefit, but our benefit. And because the Father is glorified in our prayers, John says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Please grant to us this day whatsoever things we ask in your name, as your words abide in us. We continue to pray for Leon, Larkin, and Anita, who have COVID. They have undergone uh, such trials of late. Please allow them to walk through their trials with faith, hope, and love. We pray the same thing for Harold Jones, who is waiting for a hospital bed to open up and to get his remaining treatments and surgery. We also lift up Harold Jones' grandson, Christopher, as he is again fighting COVID and he has type 1, type 1 diabetes to boot, please cure him, cure him of COVID and please don't allow any others in the household to catch it. We also continue to pray for Ian and Hannah Hammond from pancreatitis 
and her health since delivering the baby. We continue to pray for Charla Walker and her physical therapy after uh, knee operation. We also pray for Lee and Vicki Minor. Please help all these people in the way that you deem best, but especially for Vicki Minor, who underwent surgery, who is yet to go through, um, yet to go through radiation, and we ask, O oh Lord, that she please, please um, uh, don't allow her to go th through um, um, chemotherapy. We also pray for Jeff Jordan, who is the missionary of the month. Allow him to reap a harvest for his labors. Would you grant him many conversions? Please strengthen our congregation's faith so that they can say, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for sal salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. Please increase our faith. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Please turn in your copy of God's Word to Exodus 4. We'll read only verse 10 through 12. Four, Exodus 4, verses 10 through 12. <clears throat> but Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your ser servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf? or seeing, or blind. Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall speak. This is God's holy and inspired word. It contains all that we need for faith and for life. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord abides forever. Let's again pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you might speak to us through the scriptures by your spirit and that you would speak effectually to, to all of uh, this people at Pine Haven Presbyterian Church and beyond. I pray that you will speak effectually to my mouth so that I can deliver what you would have me to deliver. We pray it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I was in Houston going through radiation treatments at MD Anderson when it suddenly dawned on me that it would be a long, laborious process until I was ready to get back in the pulpit. And slowly it began creeping into my mind that I might never be able to preach again. I couldn't articulate words, even common words. I had begun to think as Moses did. I am not eloquent. I am slow of speech and tongue. I cannot do this. I cannot get back in the pulpit. And then, in the providence of God, I was reading this text in my daily Bible reading plan. I realized that my objection was exactly like Moses, and I had precisely the same need. 
that the, the Lord would speak through me. These words were exactly what I needed at the exact time that I needed it. As my father said this week, if the Lord did not intend you to preach again, he would have taken your voice. And then he paused and said, God is not done with you yet. It was a welcome message from that text that though my recovery may be difficult and it would obviously go through dips and turns, God would not leave me nor forsake me and God would speak through me. That led me to wonder if you might need this message too. Perhaps you could use this word as well. Perhaps you have said, I cannot speak to my friend or my loved ones. I cannot speak eloquently. I am slow of speech. Perhaps you need this encouragement as well. That same encourage that I have felt these past weeks. You need the promise of the triune God to quote, teach me what I am to say. These are words for me, but I suspect they are also relevant for you. So let's turn our atten attention to the text and the doctrine of the text is this. The doctrine of the text is, if you are a Christian, whatever your condition of speaking, God promises to be with you. Let me say that again. If you are a Christian, whatever your condition of speaking, God promises to be with you. Perhaps I could say it more clearly. Whatever is your condition, no matter whether you are mute or deaf or seeing or blind, and these are the extremest of conditions, regardless of your condition, God promises to be with you. This is a message for all Christians, regardless of whether you feel that you have no message to offer. God is with you. And as he said to Moses, who has made the mouth? It, is it not I? I will be with you, and I will teach your mouth what you shall speak. So the triune God says that to you. I would like to make three points in the, in the exposition. One, Moses' objection. Two, the Lord's explanation. And three, the Lord's promise. We will begin with Moses' objection. Moses, as you have just heard, makes an objection. The same Moses who had been miraculously drawn from the water. The same Moses who had appeared to him in the form of a burning bush. The same Moses who objected that the people will not believe me or listen to my voice. The same Moses who the Lord had provided powerful signs, including the staff and the leprous hand. Moses' objection, objections have been tireless. Moses', Moses objections are exhausting, at least to us. But God makes able use of these, as we will see. In verse 10, we read, But Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and tongue. This contains two objections. The first is, I am not eloquent. This contains a negative depiction of the objection. I am not eloquent. Key in on the word not. Either in the past, since you have spoken to your servant. Literally, 
I am not a man of words. Perhaps you have said this. In your moments of weakness, you have said, I am not a man of words. I am not eloquent to speak with my neighbor. She will think I'm silly. She will think I'm foolish. She will think that I'm stupid. Moses, the prophet of Israel, says this, that same Moses that you have so admired, he said this, I am not eloquent either before you have spoken to me or after. It's amazing that he should say, I am not eloquent. And likewise, it contains another objection. I am slow of speech and tongue. That's the second. I am slow of speech and tongue. Here he speaks positively of the problem. Literally, I am heavy of speech and heavy of tongue. Many Jews have speculated on this, what was the exact speech aversion, but it is likely just an excuse. In fact, according to Stephen in the New Testament, he is said to be mighty in word and deed in Acts 7.22. This aversion may have just been because Moses was a shepherd for some 40 years. Let's consider this for a moment. This excuse would say, I can't go to speak to Pharaoh. I've been a shepherd for all these years. I smell like sheep. I smell like goats. I am well past the point of being, as the New Testament says, instructed in the wisdom of the Egyptians. Perhaps you have felt like that. Perhaps you have felt like you were in the wrong occupation to make you feel credible. You have gone in the wrong business. You are not a preacher. You have been a fireman or a farmer or a vet or a business manager or a hairdresser or hospital worker. Can't you send someone else to speak to my neighbor? Can't you send, spend, uh, can't you send somebody else to make a fool of themselves? It may have just been another excuse, but the second potential excuse is past the point. In other words, Moses could speak of himself as being past the point of speaking to Pharaoh. He was past the point of speaking eloquently, past the point of speaking with speech and tongue to Pharaoh. After all, he was 80 years old. Perhaps you have felt that you are past the point of sharing your faith, past the point of giving a testimony to the work of grace in your heart. But that objection is not plausible. Whether you are 8 or 80, or 10 or 100, you are never past the point of testing, testifying to the work of grace that is in you. But now Moses gets a response, and he finds out that these are not good excuses. This brings us to the second point, the Lord's explanation. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Who has made man's mouth? This is the first subpoint. Who has made man's mouth? This is a rhetorical question. It's self-explanatory. Has not God made the mouth? God made everything. Should it follow that he had not made the mouth? Wouldn't it be that he wouldn't undergo such intricacies of the mouth? 
But he says, who has made one's mouth? He doesn't pull punches. He runs exactly to the question that Moses uh, is asking. And he says, I the Lord am he. But he says something equally profound. Subtopic two. Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I the Lord? He says, in essence, even in the extremes, extremist of condition, I still have made the mouth. Perhaps we might say that he had not done this. He has not made mute or, or a deaf person. It's just the consequence of the fall. But God says expressly, it, is it not I, the Lord? God has made each person, and each person should give glory to God because he made him. The Gospel of John records a passage in John 9. Jesus, as he passed by, saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Then Jesus healed him. Since Adam procured death for a fallen world, men and women are born mute, deaf, unseeing, or blind. But all this is under God's control. God has chosen to make men for his own purposes. Whether blind or deaf, all have been created, and all are made in the image and likeness of God. It is said in no uncertain terms, is it not I? So we must give to God the glory for making us. We did not deserve it but he has made us just the same. But the Lord attaches a promise to Moses. We come to the Lord's promises. Now, therefore, go, and I will make, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. He says, go, and I will be with you. The God who spoke the universe into existence. The God who created all, that, all into existence and made sure to providentially rule upon the creation. The God who made man. The God who made man in the image of God. The God who made man to be righteous and faithful says, go and I will be with you. You will know what you shall speak, because I will be with you. God the Father says, go, and I will be with your mouth. There is a similar, um, there is a similar word spoken to Jeremiah. He describes in chapter 1, verse 4, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord, God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord of hosts. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your, in your mouth. This is an amazing promise. 
God promises to be with Jeremiah's mouth and Moses' mouth to put his words, the Lord's words, into their mouth. But it's not just true for Jeremiah or for Moses. It is true for every believer in the new covenant as well as the old. It is not just true of of the Father that makes this promise to Jeremiah and Moses, but it indeed is in Christ, the Son of God, as the invisible God has the image of the invisible God makes the same promise to believers in the new covenant. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the ages. Christ is therefore is Christ is there to help you know what you are to say in his name. Furthermore, Christ has said, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit will recall to your mind what you need to say. The Father, in the name of Jesus, will teach you, and the Holy Spirit will remind you what you should say in his name. The triune promise is to be with you, God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Have promised to be with you and commit to you what you should say. I'm going to make uh, two applications. Continue being patient with me. I'm fully aware that I am not what I used to be. Presently, I am not a man of words, but I do have the Lord living in me who says, Whatever you have to speak, I will go with you. And I plan to preach more and more in the future. But I ask that you give me time. It is really quite a spooky thing when you look at the brain in the MRI. And to have a lime-sized cavity in the brain. It's really spooky. That, that will never grow back, that will, it just remains a cavity. And um, it will go with me for the rest of my life. Um, it doesn't grow back, it just stays the same forever. I don't know how this preaching will affect me, but I know whatever God calls me to speak, I will speak. Um, once I have at, had adequate time to heal, perhaps I will, I will be um, even better. But I need time to heal. The doctors have said the brain is like a muscle. It just takes time to heal, and you have to work it, and you have to work out to get better. And I have been really working hard. Before all the changes that we had to make in in this time of COVID, I would come to the church, but I could only stay a couple of hours. Um, And I I would just be extremely exhausted. So I'm really working hard, um, but not very quickly. To return to me, excuse me, um, I want to say, I want to say something that makes me better, if that makes sense. I am better, 
I will be more sympathetic in the future. Um, I'm not the same. Undergoing what I have undergone will not leave a person unchanged. But in the future, perhaps I will be more sympathetic. But give me time. Continue being patient with me as you have already been patient with me. Perhaps enough time, given enough time, I will be more faithful. And secondly, the Lord's speech is for you. I have used the line, I am not eloquent. Um, Make no mistake about it. But it is not rational if God has promised to be with your mouth. And he will. Regardless of whether you can't speak, he promises to speak through you. If you will be but willing. Perhaps it's in words or perhaps it's in cues. I don't know. But God will speak through you. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all promise to be with you. So it is not only implausible, it is not rational. He has, has the Lord not made the mouth. In the extremest conditions, he says, it is I, the Lord. So go knowing he will be with your mouth. He will give you what you are to speak if we will be willing. And even if we are unwilling, he will even use your mouth if you are unwilling. Moses uh, was at first unwilling to go where the Lord sent him. But God used him just the same. Go and speak of the grace of God that is in you. Go and speak from the Lord who made the mouth. And this triune promise enables the Christian, whatever the status of the Christian, to go. Whatever the condition, whether you are a farmer or a fireman or blind or deaf or mute, go with the promises in your heart to enable you to speak a word of truth. Let us pray. We thank you, O Father, that you you have enabled me to speak a word of truth from this, this passage, I trust. And wherever we go, may we say in our hearts, I will testify to the Lord Jesus Christ if you but give me an opportunity. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Receive now this benediction. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, By the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.